Our first lesson this morning comes from the Christian scriptures, the book of Matthew, chapter 21, verses 1 to 11. Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem. Hear these words from the New Revised Standard Version of the Bible. When they had come closer near Jerusalem and had reached Bethphage at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples saying to them, go into the village ahead of you and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, just say this, the Lord needs them and he will send them immediately. This took place to fulfill what had been spoken through the prophet, saying, Tell the daughter of Zion, Look, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey, and on a colt, the foal of the donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and put their cloaks on them, and he sat on them. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went of him and that followed him, shouting, Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. When he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was in turmoil, asking, Who is this? The crowds were saying, This is a prophet Jesus from Nazareth in Galilee. Our second lesson comes from the epistles, God's letter to the church in Philippi, chapter 2, verses 1 to 11. Paul writes an ancient church confession, Christ was fully divine, yet also fully human. Hear these words from Eugene Peterson's The Message. If you've gotten anything at all out of following Christ, if his love has made any difference in your life, if being in a community of the Spirit means anything to you, if you have a heart, if you care, then do me a favor. Agree with each other, love each other, be deep-spirited friends. Don't push your way to the front. Don't sweet-talk your way to the top. Put yourself aside and help others get ahead. Don't be obsessed with getting your own advantage. Forget yourselves long enough to lend a helping hand. Think of yourselves the way Christ Jesus thought of himself. He had equal status with God, but didn't think so much of himself that he had to cling to the advantages of that status no matter what. Not at all. When the time came, he set aside the privileges of deity and took on the status of a slave. He became human. Having become human, he stayed human. It was an incredibly humbling process. He didn't claim special privileges. Instead, he lived a selfless and obedient life and then died a selfless, obedient death. And the worst kind of death at that, the crucifixion. Because of that obedience, God lifted him high and honored him far beyond anyone or anything ever so that all created beings in heaven and on earth, even those long ago dead and buried, will bow in worship before this Jesus Christ and call out in praise that he is the master of all to the glorious honor of God the Father. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church today. you please pray with me? Oh God, come to us in the quietness of this very moment. 
center our hearts and our minds on you and you alone. Open us to the power and to the presence of your Holy Spirit and remind us that your love, mercy, and grace come to us unasked for and free. Amen. Who doesn't love a parade? Many of us go to parades, we'll stand for hours on the sidewalk with hundreds of others to to celebrate important holidays or to, to get a glimpse of a famous personality. We arrive early and then we're disappointed that there are others that got there before us because they have the better spot. But we jockey for the the best view as we can get. We take our stand along with others and we just stand there waiting on the sidewalk. The parade then begins. Oh, a few dignitaries and cars perhaps will go by, a, a marching band or two, and finally, well, it's the winning team or a sports celebrity, or a movie star, or whoever else it is that we've come out to see, to catch a glimpse. I remember a parade I attended when I got pretty close to President Gerald Ford. Standing up through the the sunroof of his massive black limousine, waving and reaching out to the crowd, I was 16 years old at the time, and I recall my excitement at seeing the President of the United States. Now, I wasn't politically savvy at the time, but it didn't matter because here was the most powerful person in the world, and I was literally inches away from his hand. Today is Palm Sunday, and the main character in this parade is Jesus. Jesus had already made his reputation and he had attracted quite the following. He had come to Jerusalem, the capital city, for Passover like scores of others. But there were people who wanted to catch a glimpse of him. The triumphal entry into Jerusalem is one of the few events in the life of Jesus that appears in all four gospel accounts, which tells us that this is a very important story. Putting the four accounts together, it becomes clear that the triumphal entry was a significant event, not only for the people of Jesus' day, but also for Christians throughout history. We celebrate Palm Sunday to remember this momentous occasion. Now, I got to tell you, Palm Sunday is a challenge for many clergy. Oh, we, like you, enjoy the, the festive nature of a parade, but we know that this day begins a week that will turn kind of dark. And while we know the ultimate outcome and how things are going to end up next Sunday, we cannot concentrate solely on the good and overlook the bad. So for many of those who are enjoying the festiveness of today and don't travel the rest of Holy Week, but will come back next Sunday for Easter and that celebration, We miss a lot. The phrase that has stayed with me this past week, actually it's been for a couple of weeks, it's the term turning point. Turning point is defined as a point at which significant change occurs. And I would argue that Jesus' entry into Jerusalem represents a turning point in his ministry because once he entered Jerusalem, once he passed that gate, there's no turning back. There's no turning back to the way things were 
before he arrived. The question on the lips of those in the entire city says, Matthew, who is this? Who is this? But the crowd was quick to come to its own conclusions about Jesus because in the very next verse, an answer is given to their question. The crowds were saying, this is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth of Galilee. Well, there you have it. Jesus is not a primarily a, a, a wonder worker of miracles, a, a successful physician, a rabbi who knows the Bible backwards and forwards. No, Jesus is a prophet, a speaker of the truth of God. That's what prophets do. They speak God's truth. And I expect that there were at least two reactions in the crowd that day as Jesus passed by and everyone hailed him as prophet. If you were one of the common people, that is most people, you might have been pleased, excited perhaps, for the prophets of God invariably spoke uh, for the voiceless, the naming injustices for what it was, calling the, the rich and the powerful to account on the basis of God's holy law. On the other hand, if you happen to be rich, powerful, as many of us are, we would have viewed the entry of Jesus into Jerusalem with more than a bit of dismay. You see, the prophets of Israel were notoriously tough on politicians, lawyers, bankers, the idle rich, the smug, powerful, even the clergy. <laughs> Get ready for trouble. Here comes a prophet. Now for context, the Prophecy had died out in Israel by the first century. Speakers of the truth had, had been in short supply for hundreds of years. John the Baptist was hailed by his followers as a, a modern prophet. But King Herod took one look at John and listened to a, a few of his sermons, you know, where he spoke about this business of the community and the clergy being a brood of vipers. Well, we know what happened to John real quick. Herod had him killed. You see, prophets and powerful, they don't have a close relationship. Speakers of God's truth, they're always in short supply. So no wonder a great crowd had come out to greet this new prophet. It's always easier for a preacher to go out with to go with the flow, to to pamper and flatter a congregation rather than to tell them the truth. As a young pastor, Reinhold Niebuhr said that before he became a preacher, he thought preachers were afraid to say anything controversial out of fear that they would get fired by their irate congregations. But then a few months into his ministry, Niebuhr confessed that he found the prophetic edge of his preaching softening, not because he feared criticism from his congregation, but because one shrinks from saying hard things to those you have come to love. Yes, it's hard to say tough things to people that we have grown to love. Sometimes it's true that we curb our prophetic tongues out of fear. Eh, we like a particular town, I mean, after all, the curtains have been hung in the parsonage. Why 
rock the boat. Who is this? The crowd asks. Prophet. Oh boy, things are going to heat up in town tonight. There is finally a prophet among us, and his name is Jesus. And yet, as great as prophets are, they are not enough. You see, speaking the truth is a great achievement. Yet, doing or acting on truth, well, that's another matter. Today begins the holiest of weeks in the Christian church. Holy Week comes at the end of Lent, a season of conversion, if you will, where we have been trying or, or once again turning our lives back to God. But we have to be honest with ourselves and admit to being a bit anxious about our future. I mean, we can relate to this story and the people's excitement for a prophet because we know that prophets not only tell the truth, they also save people. Hmm. Here we are, three years into this ministry, and we're probably wondering, why haven't things gone back to the way they were years ago. You know, before I arrived, when things were glorious? <laughs> or were they? Has this congregation reached a turning point? Has there been a significant change? I would argue not only in this ministry, but ministry and religious life in general, folk. At the start of my ministry with you, I said that we needed to take a look at the church in a new way. Three years ago, I said congregational renewal happens through people renewal. And while we have lost a significant number of members and friends in the past three years, because they've either died or moved away. We have also seen new people joining us, those who have an excitement for ministry, the things that we are doing here. And so we all seek spiritual nourishment together, even though our numbers are different. I had previously mentioned the the words of the Reverend Dr. John Dorhauer, the outgoing general minister and president of the United Church of Christ, who said that churches today must adapt to stay relevant. He writes, adaptability is an essential component to healthy and relevant communities of faith. It is never a question of will we change. We most certainly will. It is a question of when how and under what circumstances. Do you remember my saying those words to you three years ago? The COVID-19 pandemic challenged us at first. What a great way to start a ministry, right? Although we were forced to move worship online initially, I would say it truly has been a godsend. The research I touted during my candidating process, you'll remember, Amy, indicated that churches were moving away from Sunday-only ministry, that the ministry of the church was really viewed as 24-7, 365, and certainly, folks, not in this room, but everywhere else but this room. COVID-19 accelerated our online ministry and it has continued to grow. Look around. 
count the number of people here sitting this morning. By the end of the week, we'll multiply that by three who are watching us online. And a week doesn't go by that I don't hear from people to say how important it is to be able to participate with us online. Oh, some of them say they really wish they could be here with us, but for various reasons they can't. So our live streaming represents a lifeline. And so from my perspective, there's no turning back. More people are participating with us online than I will come on Sunday. More people come in and out of this building every day of the week than are in this room right now. So technology, or certainly a, a change of perspective of how we see ministry, that has been our turning point. So the words of the second lesson really hit home for me as we ponder our road ahead together. If being in a community of the Spirit means anything to us, if we have a heart, if we care, then agree with each other, love each other. Be deep-spirited friends. Don't push our way to the front. Don't sweet talk our way to the top. Put ourselves aside and help others get ahead. Don't be obsessed with getting our own advantage. Forget ourselves long enough to lend a helping hand. Think of ourselves the way Christ Jesus thought of himself. When those crowds standing on the sidewalk at the Palm Sunday parade hailed Jesus as a great prophet, a, a great speaker of the truth, there was a reason for celebration. A prophet of God was at last parading among them again. Matthew says that Jesus not only courageously and prophetically spoke the truth, when he entered the city on Palm Sunday. The crowds hailed him. And they said, Hosanna to the son of David. Who is this? He is son of King David, royalty, Messiah. Now, prophets often speak to kings. Jesus is king. Prophets troubled kings. But no, ever, no prophet was ever called a king. No wonder the political establishment, King Herod, Pilate, and all their court chaplains shook in their boots that final week. It's one thing for someone to prophetically preach to the king. It's another for Jesus to swing in, take charge, and be king. And there is something for which to cheer. Jerusalem came to parade thinking that they had seen a prophet, a great spokesman for God, before the Palm Sunday parade ended, many saw God. Isn't that why we are here? Even if we don't know that that's why we, hear, that we are here? I mean, we need God. We have reached a turning point. We don't need any more good advice, challenging words, or scolding, or berating, or moralizing. We simply need God. That's why we gather each week. We want to see. That's why we stand on our tippy toes at the parade. 
to see, to catch a glimpse of the holy. When Jesus dies at the end of the week on the cross, Matthew says that the whole world heaves the veil in the temple, the veil separating us from the holy of holies was ripped from top to bottom. The veil separating us mere mortals from the living God, it was ripped because in Jesus, we are now brought closer to God. Nothing separates us from the love of God. And this becomes our turning point, the place where we are changed. There's no turning back. It is why seeing Jesus moving in the parade toward Orleans, toward us and our need, we are moved from saying or from asking, we are moved from asking who is this to joining the chorus. Hosanna in the highest. Amen.